Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and well off an Auto House of Naples, but not today again. Uh, today I've got one from Uncle Johnny. Uh, just an absolute favorite, this guy. I mean, he has delivered some of the funnest stuff that we've gotten to do so far. And uh, this one is no exception, and it's a terrific way to start off the new year. I mean, it absolutely is. After that ridiculous farting Tesla uh, at the end of uh, 2021, it's nice to have something proper, something lovely, something I can sink my teeth into, and something that's frankly uh, just much more me. Um, quick news update, uh, the, the sister still stuck in Ireland, still with the COVID baby, and well, he's been 17, so I guess he's not much of a baby, but um, he's got COVID, and that had to uh, delay their flight, they're stuck over there, now the husband has it, and you know, if I'm giggling, you know, God help me, it's, you know, what can I do? It's just one of those Schuyden-Fraud moments where, uh, you know, you know somebody should have done something so ridiculous, and now they're pain for it, but my heart goes out to her. That said, the car is still languishing in uh, long-term parking over in Fort Lauderdale, and that's where it's going to remain, uh, because I just have absolutely no intention of going over there and getting it for her. Uh, I'm off to Meekum tomorrow. I'm not looking, I got to be honest with you, it's an enormous 10-day auction. I'm stuck there for a week. I've already got a load of cars. I don't need any more, and it's hard to buy cars at Meekum anyway that you can sell and even break even on. So uh, I've got one that we're taking over there to sell. I'm going to try and do a review of it tomorrow. I don't know if I will or not, so I'm not going to name it. But uh, if I do, it's going to be pretty unique and something we haven't done before. Uh, but because of that and because I'm babysitting that car, I'm going to be hanging out there for a while doing next to nothing. And I don't know how the hell I'm going to entertain myself in Kissimmee uh, unless they've got, you know, tons of Asian massages and casinos and bars and that sort of thing, which, uh, of course, hopefully they do. But anyway, look, uh, Animal Front, again, next to nothing. There was a big flock of birds that flew through about 10 minutes ago, but it's gone. Uh, Peter's strange violent cat, I haven't seen it this morning. And uh, apparently Peter himself is back because I see the RV uh, has returned. It's over there with the sliders out. I don't think anyone's in there, but it's over there. And uh, that means he's uh, recovering from whatever New Year's Year's Eve festivities uh, super rich guys have when they're flaunted around with their uh, fancy cars and women and, you know, highfalutin stuff while the rest of us are plugging away at work. So I'm sure I'll get an update at some point that'll make me furious, but I'll listen to it. And uh, that said, we're going to dive and leap directly into this car and ignore all the airplane noise overhead. We already had a Cessna earlier, now we've got some sort of a private jet going. Going, so wonderful. Uh, but what I have today is a 1973 Pontiac Grand Am. And I'm going to be deadly honest with you. When I first saw this in Uncle Johnny's garage, I really didn't remember it. I didn't even know it existed. And my research on the car has panned out why. Uh, there just weren't that many of them left, and we'll get into why as we go. Uh, but this is the original Grand Am. And, I mean, the Grand Am is a car that I associate with those uh, kind of shitty little front drive things that came out in the 80s and 90s, and all of them were finished in that weird green color and... Uh, uh, you know, they were new for a while, and then they got driven by hefty ladies to the dollar store for many, many years afterwards until Cash for Clunkers came out, and then they all disappeared. So um, that's what I associated with Grand Ams, and uh, that's why it's a very special treat for me to be reviewing this one and actually having to learn about it a little bit. Uh, they, frankly, it was sort of a forgotten car from GM, uh, and they, 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 while that one that front wheel drive car was very, very successful for Pontiac, shockingly. Uh, this was the exact opposite. It was a bomb. It did not work out for them at all. Uh, it lasted for only three model years. It sold fairly well the first one, but quickly declined. And uh, I think that's a shame because I think not only was it 
probably the most interesting of the colonnade coupes, and we've done some colonnades before. We've done uh, uh, Cutlass Supremes and Monte Carlos and uh, even a uh, Buick uh, Century recently. Uh, I do think this Grand Am is probably the most interesting of them, and uh, it's a shame that it's one that even me as a pretty heavy-duty car guy uh, really didn't have on his radar screen. Uh, but it was, you know, look, it... it the failure of this car was more about the timing and bad luck uh, than it was about the car itself. Uh, market forces and politics and everything else collaborated to sort of ruin this thing. And it's an absolute shame because it really, again, was one of the most interesting and possibly one of GM's best cars of the 1970s. Um, it was an attempt to take Pontiac's sort of hot car formula. I mean, they were the performance division, basically. You know, they, they brought out the GTO. Some would argue it, it started the, the true muscle car phase of the 60s and uh, was, of course, an icon all throughout that, even though muscle cars were sort of fading by this time. Uh, the, the, it was a move by the people at Pontiac to update that and bring in something else, something in addition to it. And uh, it has a story that's um, that's pretty interesting, okay? The plan for the feel of the car is different from the plan of the look of the car, but the feel came from a guy named Bill Collins. He was a product developer at Pontiac, and he was an acolyte of uh, John DeLorean, who was running Pontiac all through the late 1960s. Uh, he went, you know, later went on to do Chevy, and then later went on to do his own car, the DeLorean, if you remember. <laughs> who could ever forget that? And in fact, Bill Collins uh, joined him at DeLorean in later years. But uh, Collins had gone over to Europe to visit Opel's headquarters in Germany, and somebody he knew over there in lent him a BMW. It was probably a 2800 CS, a pretty famous car and a pretty cool coupe and one that was starting to get noticed in the United States. And when he drove it, he liked it. And one of the things that he really liked about it was the way that it combined sportiness with luxury. And that's something that the American car companies really hadn't been doing. Uh, the muscle cars were essentially really Spartan, light, you know, the machines not really focused at all on luxury. They were all about power, while the luxury cars really weren't all that focused on performance or handling. They were just focused on luxury. And here he's driving this BMW thinking, man, this has kind of given me the best of both worlds. I'd like to get something like this going for, you know, Pontiac. Uh, Pontiac then was developing what was going to become the new GTO uh, in 1972. It got delayed a year later on. Uh, but they were, you know, it was going to be based on a colonnade coupe, this A body like this one. And they wanted to give it something that would separate it from the rest, that would move it on from the muscle car era. Uh, you know, the way the politics were going, the way gas prices were skyrocketing, uh, the embargo wasn't out yet, but it was about to happen. And, uh, you know, things were edging up. Insurance costs, because of all the idiot kids driving their Chevelles into trees, were on the rise. And, and uh, it was definitely a change in the way the American consumer uh, was looking at things. The muscle car was really losing uh, its um, position as, you know, something that people wanted. And uh, they were starting to edge towards personal luxury coupes like the Grand Prix, uh, the Monte Carlo, and other stuff that wasn't quite so focused on performance. Uh, so the GTO was going to be updated and these guys started working on a body design using the colonnade platform and they started doing sketches you know um to make, you know, to bring the car in line. Don't forget, in 73, it was 72 was when the design went, but there was a big strike, there were supply problems, so the new car got pushed off till 73. Gets a bit confusing, and that's why this is a 73 model and not a 2. Uh, but uh, they wanted it to look different and look cool. And one of the issues they had to overcome was the new 5 mile an hour bumper laws, which were, you know, you had all these sort of elegant designs, this new bumper law, so basically, car companies were putting uh, big chrome things that looked like railroad ties on the front and rear of the car. They just didn't match the design at all. Uh, for the GTO, they wanted to 
remedy that. And what they did was come up with this front end. So where there's, there's some sketches made with this big prominent beak uh, using a urethane nose. And that, it was not new. This car didn't pioneer it. It actually came out in 68. The prior GTO had a urethane nose, but uh, now it had to be molded onto this longer, lower, more pronounced colonnade body. And it had to blend in with the five mile an hour bumper. And man, did they do a nice job of it. And I think it's the most distinguishing feature of the, well, it's debatably the most distinguishing feature of the car. Uh, but it, it is unique to the car. I mean, it's got this enormous protruding beak in the center. And uh, the, it's called the Endura nose. And it was made out of uh, polyurethane. And that's part of what doomed this car, by the way. But uh, we'll get into that as we go. Uh, but by protruding that and protruding the front enders, uh, front enders, I love that. That's the coronavirus whiskey. Protruding the front fenders into these sort of knife edge things at the front, they managed to diminish the impact of that sort of five mile an hour bumper uh, that's painted body color beneath it. Give it sort of a race car looking front end. And uh, it all looked very, very attractive. Uh, like I said, it was going to be the GTO, but that name was now associated with the past and Pontiac wanted something for the future. So they moved it over to what they called the Grand Am. And uh, the Grand Am was supposed to hearken to a few things. For one, it was supposed to hearken to the Grand Prix, which was more of a true personal luxury coupe uh, that was really starting to sell very well and gain quite a following. Uh, it also hearkened to the Trans Am, which of course was a sporty, a big power, you know, almost race car of the street type thing with a big shaker hood and whatnot. Uh, so you've got the Grand Am, which combined the two. It also, I believe, was supposed to harken to Can-Am racing, uh, which was pretty popular at the time. Uh, but uh, the reason that it became the Grand Am and not the GTO was pure marketing. Uh, that's exactly the reason. Uh, it was going to be the new vibe of Pontiac performance. Apparently, Bill Mitchell, the very famous designer, walked in on a sketch of this car and said, holy Jesus Christ, holy shit. Uh, he thought it was the most incredible thing he'd ever seen, and it, it very much prompted the uh, uh, forward momentum of this getting onto the GTO, uh, which, of course, um, then became the Grand Am, and which was then delayed a little bit until it could be made. All right, so look, real quick on this particular car. This is a tremendous outlier, this one. I mean, we've got what's already a rare car for reasons. I mean, they made, they, I think, 47,000 of them this year, uh, 35,000 two-door coupes like this one, and then a few of the four-doors, uh, which is not a small number. I mean, it's small by Jim. Isn't that angry friggin' bird over there? God, I hope he stays in the trees. Uh, holy God. Anyway, not a small number, although it is by GM standards. But then you go into year two, it went down to like 17,000. Uh, of course, the embargo had hit by then. This thing got 11 miles to the gallon and was quickly becoming forgotten. And then in year three, 75, it sold like 10,000. And that was it. They decided not to update it. Uh, they killed it. A couple of years later, they brought out the, um, the Can-Am, which was uh, similar in theme theme and probably incorporated some of the stuff that would have happened if this car kept going. Uh, but that's also a neat footnote in uh, GM history, and that's a car that I'd like to get my hands on. Uh, but this thing, so even though few were saved, and it's a little bit rare, this one gets exceedingly rare. Uh, it has the 400, the smaller motor, uh, but the four barrel with du uh, dual exhaust, which pumped it up to near the 455 numbers, and the four-speed gearbox, a manual Muncie Synchromesh uh, that was almost never ordered with this car. I mean, it's uh, again, Uncle Johnny has come through. He just he finds these unicorns out there, and uh, this is one of them. Never mind, it's an original 38,000 mile car of a car that frankly wasn't that saved and that beloved for so long. Uh, but it's also got this intensely rare four speed, and uh, you really have to hand it to the guy. Uh, he has uh, just absolutely incredible incredible taste in cars. And uh, this was the hottest setup you could get while having the uh, four-speed manual. Uh, but Pontiac sales literature at the time, and, and let me pull my, forget me, let me pull a note out for this because I have to quote directly. 
All right, it said this. It said this car has the feel of a Grand Prix, the response of a GTO, the qualities you've admired in the desirable imports, and we think you'll find our unique new Grand Am a more than acceptable alternative to the costly imports. And, you know, I guess it could have been. It was half the price of a BMW or Mercedes. It was still expensive. It was like a grand more than the luxury Le Mans, so it wasn't cheap. And even with that, and I mean, we're talking about 25% more. That's no small potatoes back then. Uh, it sold extremely well in comparison to the luxury Le Mans. So this did kind of work. And pulling from the Grand Prix, pulling from the Trans Am, uh, this mission to attract luxury and performance buyers at the time, import buyers, you know, it seemed to work pretty well just for a very brief moment. Uh, they did make the GTO in 73, by the way. It was an option package on the Le Mans, but it did like 4,000 units or so. Uh, just not that many out there. And it used the big railroad tie front bumper. It did have the same, uh, uh, what are they called? The NACA ducts up there, which uh, we'll get into in a minute, but um, uh, it just didn't sell nearly as well. So. You know, there were a lot of kids who were around at the time who loved these cars and saw them everywhere. And, and you know, when they get, were of age to buy them, they wanted to go out and get them, but they were gone. And uh, there's, a, there's a very good reason for that. So I tell you what, look, I'm going to pause for a minute, and then we're going to get into the exterior of this car and uh, keep rolling around and go from there. So bear with me one moment. All right, so let's have a walk around this thing. Again... Very prominent is the front end of this car with that big Endura beak. I mean, without question, that is a pretty notable design feature of the car. Uh, you've also got a catwalk grille split, uh, six holes, three on each side, uh, hearkening to, of course, Pontiac lineage of the split grille, and uh, I think it looks absolutely terrific. Uh, you've got a body-colored uh, bumper, which is, again, that five-mile-an-hour bumper that nicely, nicely integrates. It's as nice as any five mile an hour bumper law was integrated in any GM car at the time, without question. Uh, down low, you've got um, running lights, which kind of look like fogs, you know, kind of a uh, maybe a harken into the European styling. You've got the arrowhead in the center. Uh, you've got that swooped V hood, uh, which is another Pontiac style feature. And uh, then these two NACA ducts. Uh, what the hell does that stand for? Is it the precursor to NASA? And I almost always... The National Association for the Advancement of Women or something. Oh, God, what the hell is it? Um... Oh, it's going to drive me absolutely crazy. The National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Uh, that was the precursor to NASA. Uh, what this was, what these are intakes that don't cause any turbulence. They're, you know, of course, a design feature. You'd see them all over airplanes and jets and that sort of thing. And then car companies thought, well, why the hell not use them on cars? And uh, you'd see them on four, you know, Mach 1s, I believe, used them. And there's some other notable cars. The GTO used them. Uh, NACA ducts became a thing. Uh, these were supposed to be a ram air system uh, well, originally. They were supposed to be very operative, particularly when it was going to be a GTO, uh, but it very quickly violated these new drive-by noise standards and had to be made in-op, which is a shame, but at least they kept them uh, because they do look incredibly cool. And my understanding is you could get them on just about any of these Pontiac colonnades at the time. It was an order, uh, but uh, I believe they came on all of the Grand Am. And I think a few GTOs slipped through that had functional ones, and then you could buy some over the counter. Uh, but all in all, it's just an extremely rare thing. Uh, the side of the car is very, very cool. You've got this reverse knife blade coming off the front fenders, going to the middle of the door. Uh, you got Grand Am badging on the uh, quarter panel with kind of a... You know, again, with the sort of weird Euro red stripe, you know, blue star thing, American, but not. Uh, you got rally two wheels. You could also get honeycombs on it. Uh, you've got minimal chrome trim. I mean, it's there, but it's minimized. You've got it around the uh, windshield. You've got it in a very pencil thin fashion around the side windows. Uh, you've got a little bit of chrome or, you know, aluminum trim running down the uh, quarter panel and uh, rear quarter on the uh, running board running board <sighs> rocker panel 
Uh, you've got hidden wipers, which are also kind of a Euro thing. You've got sport mirrors. You've got this stripe, which uh, runs from the front of the car, swoops around, comes up the uh, C pillar, or the B pillar there, and in some instances actually would go over the uh, top of the roof. And uh, the louvered rear windows, very, very cool, nice little feature, and uh, kind of a cool way to minimize the fact that the rear windows on colonnade coupes did not go down. That goes into this fastback roof with a uh, heavily angled uh, rear glass into a swooping trunk line into a couple of vertical, uh, or sorry, horizontal taillights with a chrome bumper. I mean, it's kind of a beautiful design. You see the twice pipes there under the bumper, part of this option package. Uh, this was interesting. You see it says 6.5 liter, and uh, of course that became a 6.6 when the 400 was in the Trans Am later. Uh, but they did this with liters and 6.5 to harken to European roots, you know, like the 3.0 CS uh, BMW instead of having the cubic inches, which uh, is what most American cars would have at the time. Uh, pretty incredible amount of air in the wheel wells, as was the norm at the time, but, you know, for some reason it just looks fine. Uh, you know, no chrome around the rear marker lamps. Again, more of a Euro thing. Uh, the standard door handles for a Pontiac, but all in all, a very European looking car uh, for an American car, and uh, it does, I think, stand apart from the way uh, most colonnades did end up looking. They almost all geared towards being uh, luxury cars, and uh, this one didn't. This one, even though it has all the luxury features, uh, definitely has some sporty European flair to it. So, uh, I know I'm pausing a lot, but I've got the sun coming up. I'm going to have to move the car forward. So, uh, let me let me tell you what. Fuck it. We'll do. The, I'm going to quickly do the trunk and do under the hood. Then we'll move it forward and do the interior. So, all right. Bear with me. Pop the key in here and see what we got. <clears throat> All right, this is pretty standard stuff. You've got a nice big trunk, although it does have a tremendous threshold that you have to clear to get stuff in there. So they did, you know, they did uh, compromise a little bit with design on trunk use, which, you know, to me is fine. Uh, I believe we have a flip down license plate where you're going to find your gas door. Uh, you got a full size spare up there, which is great. All the jacking hardware underneath, a little splatter paint. Just a very typical GM trunk of the uh, 1970s. And uh, everything looking pretty good in there. Uh, nowhere to strap an infant down, so if you throw one in there or a toddler, they're just going to bounce around. But, um, you know, and in fact, it's going to be rough on them because you got the rubber tire, you've got the hard edges of the jack. Uh, you may want to stick some uh, packing material in there, you know, like a bubble wrap or, you know, moving blankets or something if you don't want them to get knocked around too much. And uh, other than that, if you go easy on it, they probably won't get, uh, get bumped up too much. So anyway, that's the trunk. And man, is it just a weird, unique feel uh, the way it curves down. Have a look under the hood. Can't wait to get into the interior. That's also a fascinating place in this car. And I love those ducts. God, are they cool. All right, so this is a work in progress, as Uncle Johnny told me. The underhood area of this car was never restored, and uh, this is the way that he got it. So he's in a, in a way, I think it's slated in a month or so to go to some shop where they're going to pull the engine and refinish it all. Uh, but uh, for the moment, if we were going to do this car, we were going to get it this way. And uh, anyway, it's kind of interesting to see one uh, that's as it came with uh, zero reconditioning at all. Uh, you can see there is Pontiac's 400. Now... Uh, Pontiac really didn't have big block, small block stuff. I mean, they, I think all of their blocks were basically the same size and weren't denoted like Chevy with big block, small block. It just had to do with bore, stroke, that sort of thing, which gave them the different uh, displacements. Uh, you could get a 455 in this car, which, you know, Pontiac held out the big, powerful motors longer than everyone else did. And, in fact, did some evil tricks, which were great. Uh, in 73, the early cars had this 
sort of trick EGR valve uh, that was meant to work just long enough for the emissions regulators to test it and then shut off and <laughs> do away with the gas recirculation. Uh, they did figure that out. They fined Pontiac and they made him fix it. But uh, it was, you know, you have to hand it to the company for doing shit like that. Uh, but anyway, this one was the 400 with the four uh, barrel carburetor and the dual exhaust, which again was the only way you could get that uh, Muncie four speed synchro mesh. So uh, whoever ordered this thing was a real and genuine car guy. Uh, you see it has the air conditioner there. Again, a guy after my own heart. Um, I get it. Without it, it's more sporty, but man, is it nice to have when it's hot out. So uh, everything looking proper uh, under the hood and, you know, very ready for whatever restoration is going to head its way. So, okay, there it is. So with that, oh, yeah, real quick, I should go into the mechanicals. God, God how did I forget that? That was a huge part of this car, uh, was that it had to handle. This was one of only three cars that came standard with radial tires at the time. It had what was called a radial tuned suspension, uh, which meant that it got stiffer bushings, it got front and rear anti-sway bars, it got a tighter steering box, uh, it had Piasol shocks, uh, the solid rear axle, but, you know, set up for sportiness. Also in the front, again, stiffer spring ratios, that sort of thing. And the car did handle better uh, than most of its compatriots at the time. It just had a much more uh, stiffer, firmer, confident ride. And universally, the people who drove it loved it. The way it handled uh, was a big plus, and the car magazines thought so too. Uh, it also had front disc brakes, power standard, uh, rear drums, and uh, it just, uh, you know, again, part of that mission of Pontiac to, um, uh, to make the car more... European and feeling, and uh, they did pull that off. You know, it gives you this idea of what could have been. I mean, you know, again, the muscle car era was dying, which is a real shame, but what if it wasn't? What if the 70s didn't bring the gas crunch and the insurance crunch and all these other shitty crunches that made things shitty and the federal regulators? What if the muscle car was allowed to develop naturally? Uh, this is an idea of what it would have become as it moved away from just being pure quarter mile horsepower into a more complete package that gave you handling and amenities. Uh, you know, we would have had cars that were much more modern, uh, much quicker, uh, without all of that, um, you know, the politics and, and the world events and everything else collaborating to screw things up. Uh, you know, when car makers were forced to make their engines anemic, when they were uh, forced to, uh, buyers couldn't opt for that because they had to pay too much insurance, everything went to these big, uh, it was a mixture. You either bought a small, shitty Japanese car, which was very high quality, but uh, tediously boring and not very powerful, or some big anemic luxury cruiser that still had a 460, but put out 120 horsepower. Uh, it's a real shame. If none of those political factors had happened, I think this Grand Am is a good inkling of what things could have become, and uh, unfortunately it became a victim of the times. Um, I said that not many were saved. Part of that is the politics where, you know, all of a sudden when gas is 50 cents a gallon, which is a lot back then, people, oh, you don't want that Pontiacs or gas guzzlers. That thing gets 11 miles to the gallon, which was true. So they were kind of abandoned for that reason. Number two was that Endura nose, that polyurethane nose, uh, very quickly would deteriorate and rot despite Pontiac's best efforts. And there was no aftermarket support. And after the uh, factory supply was lost, was gone, uh, there was no way really to restore the car. And they just vanished. They vanished by, you know, 10 years after this car was made. Uh, you just didn't see any anymore. I mean, maybe a few were thrown under car covers with blown out front noses waiting for a better day. And uh, it is true that once an aftermarket part emerged, more of these cars came out of the woodwork. Uh, but because of the times, because of the politics, and because of that very difficult to restore front end. So many of these cars were lost, and you just don't see them today, uh, either in this coupe or the, uh, the more rare four-door version. So... Anyway, there it is. I'm going to run the car forward, uh, get out of the sun a little bit, then we're going to do the interior and go for a drive. Bear with me. 
All right, so if any of you are doubting the seriousness with which uh, these Pontiac guys went after making this car European, having a look at the inside should, should definitely uh, allay those doubts. Uh, first of all, you see the uh, bucket seats. And, I mean, man, do they frankly look very European. I mean, the way the uh, the front cushion is, the way it's rounded, the uh, the back, they recline. They could also be power. And then, incredibly, they have lumbar support. Look at that. So, I mean, not only do they recline like the European cars with these little weird twisty things down here, the Mercedes style, uh, they also have a, an adjustable lumbar, which is just not something American cars had at the time. Uh, that's a pretty big indication right there. Uh, back seat, you're going to be able to get three Canadians in there. They're going to be pretty chipper, I have to say. Uh, you do have a tranny hump. Uh, you do have a transmission hump, so the one in the middle is going to have to straddle. But otherwise, it's a pretty wide seat, plenty of room to spread out. you got louvers there, which is kind of cool. Uh, you got a package shelf you could probably throw an infant or toddler up on. And uh, tons of legroom, so all very nice stuff. Uh, door panel-wise, a pretty intricate design. I mean... It's kind of a nice, expensive-feeling vinyl. Uh, you got this cool, buckly-looking door pull here. Uh, this one has window cranks. You could often see power windows. It has a little armrest for you. It has ashtrays for the rear passengers, which, uh, of course, people smoked at this point, and uh, an adjustable side view mirror. Uh, before I hop in, because I'm pretty close to the wheel, I'll do this from here. Uh, the steering wheel, uh, very much designed after the Mercedes at the time with the uh, sort of stainless three prongs, the prominent center, the leathery grip all around it, you know, definitely meant to have a European flair to it. And uh, these cars only came uh, with the front bucket setup. There was no column shift. Uh, all of them had the uh, split uh, bucket seats with the center console. So let's get in. Uh, they also came with full gauges and real wood, by the way, which was another Euro touch. Now, uh, the dashboard was lifted basically from the Grand Prix. It's essentially the same, uh, but it was European enough for the Grand Am, and this one did have the tack option, which is nice. Uh, that moved the clock down there in front of the gear shift. Uh, but, you know, when you're sitting here, you have this terrific view of your gauges. I mean... It's so much more ergonomically correct than the Tesla we drove the other day, for instance. It gives you much better and much more proper information. Uh, you got your headlight switch here. You got your washers here. Uh, you got, uh, of course, the 70s Pontiac cigarette lighter over there. Your climate control, your rear defrost, your AM FM stereo, which uh, is this a stereo? You got no, it's a radio. You got two speakers, one in the back, one in the front. Uh, there's your clock. Here's your gear shift. Uh, you got another big ashtray here. Nice stuff. You got a pretty cool center console here that feels. Uh, it's a nice, unlike European cars, it feels kind of expensive. They do, but it also feels like it's going to keep working, and that's something they don't. Uh, you got a nice little oh shit grab handle there for the 400. Uh, Johnny's got all his stuff in here, owner's manuals, insurance documents. Uh, here's uh, the original... Uh, uh, ordering uh, thing for the car. He showed me a window sticker. The few options on it are air conditioning, AM, FM, um, of course, the uh, 400 four speed, four barrel, and a uh, few other bits and pieces. So, pretty well optioned car. Uh, and there it is. I mean, again, it's just got this feel, this flare, this. Even the horn, by the way, is a higher note. Uh, than most American cars of the time, which is supposed to give it a European feel. Instead of having a switch on the floor for the high beams, uh, it uses a switch here on the turn signal stock, like the European cars would. So, all right, let's take this thing for a spin. Uh, like other cars of this era, you have to be in reverse to... Why am I talking over starting the engine? Let's do that again. I'm so sorry I deprived people of that. I'm going to shut the hell up. That's nice. There's that uh, Pontiac 400 fire into life. Uh, I'm going to very quickly head out so we can hear it burble in the back. Still up on the choke for a minute. Ah, let it be on choke. Let's see how it sounds at the rear. Actually, 
nice and subdued. I think he's got Cadillac mufflers on this thing. He hasn't changed it from factory. All right, so anyway, there you see, you got your tack, you got your oil pressure, your water temp, your volts, your fuel, 120 mile an hour speedo, 38,000 miles on this thing. Man, it's just epic. Let's just shut up and drive it. I love the view over the front. You can actually see the NACA ducts in front of you, which is neat as hell. I didn't think you'd be able to see those, but that looks cool. Uh, you've also got those uh, big uh, knife edge fenders looking cool and the swoopy V uh, in the hood with the, the lights. I didn't mention they were round lights with rectangular bezels that I think look cool. Man, is this just a neat car to drive. Johnny has, God, does he have good taste in cars. Holy shit. What are we gonna get next from this guy? I can't pin the windshield on Dalton. If it's dirty, he didn't have anything to do with it. Never even seen this car. Man, it's not the cleanest. I'm surprised at just how nice the clutch feels, by the way. It reminds me of that Cougar. Uh, I was expecting something a lot heavier, um, you know, where you'd have to really stress your leg to get the clutch in. And man, does it shift nice and smooth. And I don't think that's just the, uh, uh, the European thing. I just think that's a well-tuned, uh, well-adjusted clutch from an American car in the 70s. And I think this is just the way they feel uh, when they're not, um, you know, supercharged for performance or whatever, big heavy clutches and springs and all that, uh, when it's just the way that it came from the factory. I think they just have a nice driving feel to them. I mean, the steering is tight. Uh, the ride is fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's very, very responsive. I mean, definitely one of the best handling cars of the era. And uh, it feels lovely going down the road. I mean, it really feels like you could just daily drive this thing without any issues whatsoever. I'm, like I'm coasting along at under 2,000 in fourth gear. God, what a nice driving machine. If he ever sells his collection, man, I tell you what, it's going to set uh, Meekum on fire with Barrett Jackson wherever he ends up taking it. He has got some neat stuff. secondaries. So you've got 230 horsepower. Really comes into its own in the higher revs. And just what a machine to operate. I mean, I'm not going to be an idiot and start trying to do donuts or anything. You know, this... <laughs> I learned my lesson on the other ones. Uh, it's just, you know... Nice old cars like this aren't used to abuse. Johnny's always like really, and oh man, go out, tear it up, tear it up. It needs it, it loves it, it wants it. Yeah, that's easy to say, you know, as I do a donut into this ridiculous Hyundai looking thing over there. It's the last thing I need um, is to, uh, you know, start explaining to Johnny how I cracked up as, you know, one of the 50 four speed 73 Grand Ams. But what a nice driving piece. And you can feel it, man. You can feel the tightness of it and the way that it, you know, was intended to have a European flair. So look, I'm not going to ramble on. It is what it is. Uh, this car is not for sale. It is not an auto house car. Yeah, so that's great. Ran out of memory card storage, always at the most opportune times. Uh, anyway, look, again, the car is not for sale. It's part of a private collection. Please don't call the sales guys and torture them. They don't even know this car exists, and they already hate me for a variety of other cars, so go easy on them. Um, thank you very much for having a look. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for checking out the 73 Grand Am. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get anything up for a while because I'm in this uh, uh, kiss Kissimmee for a week. I might try and get something going tomorrow and then uh, edit it uh, while I'm over there and release it. But no promises at all. A lot of things have to happen for that to come together. So uh, if it doesn't, I'll probably see you with something cool at the end of next week. 
And uh, again, I can't thank you guys enough for having a look at this thing and watching the videos. And uh, we'll try to have some really fun stuff going forward. Uh, take care. Have a great day. Going back to Johnny, so no highway drive, I'm sorry to say. And uh, we will uh, see you with the next one. Take care.